we are here today to focus on those students, the students who make, um, who bear many cultures within themselves and who make that cultural immersion journey every day. And to present that panel, I'd like to give you Dr. Etta Kralovec. Hi, when it's star days, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you for the opportunity to chair this round table. It is an honor to be in conversation with these border scholars. This transnational and migrant educational journeys roundtable explores the educational realities for transnational and migrant students on the US-Mexico border. Drawing on examples across the educational spectrum, members of the roundtable include students who cross the border each day and researchers from US and Mexico. Our guests on the roundtable today are Dr. Vanessa Fallon, Dr. Martha Gutierrez, Dr. Ileana Reyes, Dr. Gloria Valdez, Teresa Acevedo, and Selena Martinez. They have extended biographies on the APLEC website, but now I would just like to share a little bit about how this panel came to be. Great. Okay, so as I said, I'm Professor Etta Kralovec, but I would like to start with uh, a story about how I came to know that this place, who Mimi Espos are, and how this panel came to be. I came to the University of Arizona in 2006 to help establish a new teacher education program. I live in Bisbee, Arizona, Chiricahua Apache ancestral homelands, and four miles from the US Sonora border. This is what the border looked like in my community when I arrived here. Local artists offered cla art classes to kids on both sides of the border and the wall between us was covered with student art. I had the privilege of doing field work on the Rio Sonora with Dr. Miribel Alvarez the first summer I was here. And it is really through her eyes that I came to see and understand this place for the first time. Those days are long gone. <laughs> After racist anti-immigrant legislation has flooded Arizona and the border has become a militarized zone. As I began preparing teachers for this area, I came to see the enormous opportunity gaps in the schools along the border, the revolving door of science and math teachers and the lack of informal educational experiences in communities. This is what I often think the kids must feel like who go to school here. In 2010, I received a $2 million federal grant to redesign the teacher education program and to recruit and prepare STEM teachers for border schools. When I did an interview with a news outlet at the time, they asked me what the most compelling thing was about this work. And I talked about the students who cross the border each day to come to school. Within two hours, I was getting calls from right-wing news media in Phoenix demanding to know the names of these children. I was soon told that we don't talk about these kids. Now, even as a little girl, when my grandmother tried to shush me and tell me we couldn't talk about that, I always wanted to talk about what we couldn't talk about. I tried to talk to the school administrators about these kids and was quickly steered onto other topics. A few years ago, I was on a panel at the Association for Borderland Studies annual meeting with Dr. Vanessa Fallon. When she talked about her work with trans-border students, I thought, wow, here is a courageous woman who's talking about what we're not supposed to talk about. Over the years, I have had the honor of hosting international researchers from Finland and Mexico who conducted research in our schools. In 2016 and 17, I had the privilege of co-hosting teachers from Mexico who conducted research projects in schools in Douglas and Bisbee. These teachers were part of the US-Mexico Bilateral Forum on Higher Education, Innovation and Research, OBESI a project funded in part by the Mexican government. And in 2016, our project was named Best Practice 
by Mexico State Department. FOBASI research projects have allowed me to see border education issues from a very different perspective. These teachers from Mexico asked very hard questions about our schools. They tousled with school administrators about their research questions, and they generally pulled back some curtains. These were primarily young women who talked about things we weren't supposed to talk about. Dr. Martha Gutierrez, who is with us today, was a Fobesi scholar, as I hope a number of folks in the audience joining us are, so shout out to Fobesi folks there. When Dr. Eliana Reyes was named Associate Dean of the College of Education, I was thrilled when I learned about her research in Douglas. I, would sure, I was sure she would have a special place in her heart for the children on the border and that she would be intellectually drawn to the educational complexity of border schools and that she would have a deep understanding of place in the shaping of border identity. We now have an emerging community of border educators and scholars associated with the newly formed Borderlands Education Center. The vision for the Borderlands Education Center is to create an intellectual hub in the rural borderlands of southeastern Arizona and northern Mexico, expanding learning and research opportunities for border teachers, researchers, and communities. But now let's start talking about things we're not supposed to talk about. I'd like to introduce Dr. Vanessa Fallon, who's going to start us off. And uh, if time permits, we'll take questions. And if not, we'll just move on to Dr. Gutierrez. So Vanessa, are you there? <laughs> Greetings. Yes, I am here. And hello. Um, hello. It is, mm -hmm. It's nice to see you. I sent a PowerPoint um, for today's presentation, um, but I'm also happy to share my screen if that's um, helpful. Also, not a doctor yet. Doctoral candidate. I will be defending this spring, though. Just want to clarify. Um, okay, so greetings once again. Uh, soy Vanessa Falconorta, transfronteriza de la región San Diego, Tijuana, tierra de la nación Kumiai. I'm also a scholar and organizer, focusing my work on transfronterizo students in the San Diego, Tijuana border region, and founding director of the Transfronterizo Alliance Student Organization and uh, founding director of the Transporter Student Ally Program at San Diego State. Today, I'll be sharing with you my uh, work focused on transfronteriso students in post-secondary and higher education. Specifically, I'm working on a concept which is called transborder identity. With this concept, what it is is that I'm looking at who are transporter students, um, specifically starting with identity. To understand the identities of transfronteriso students, I begin with the context, their environment, specifically that is a transborder context and understanding the U.S.-Mexico border. So what are the elements of the U.S.-Mexico border? To start, the U.S.-Mexico border is an interdependent border, highly policed and militarized. Since its inception, it was created through violence and racism. This is important because this is the environment that transporter students engage in daily as transporter students cross the border daily. Part of the transborder context is also the concept of transborderism. Through transborderism, we can understand how transborder students engage in this context. How do they develop? How do, how do they adapt? Specifically, they do develop transborder cultural capital. Transborder cultural capital influences their identities. So identity, some of the concepts illustrated in the literature, and you know, I have to say I'm very grateful for the literature that is out there on transborder students. Some of these concepts are related to resistance, belonging, code switching, translanguaging, agency. And a question I had was intersectionality. So based on these experiences, how do transporter students interact in their environment uh, based on their inter the intersections of their identities? So how is it like to be a woman and cross the border or be transgender? So that is where I, I further engaged on exploring transborder identity through my dissertation work through a constructivist grounded theory study of a total of 20 photo voice one-on-one -on -one interviews, 11 photo voice focus groups consisting of 690 images with transfronterizo students in higher education and post-secondary, both 
pre and post pandemic. So data collection I was through three phases um, informed with uh, informed by constructivist grounded theory. So um, open initial data collection and analysis, focused data collection analysis, and then Axel. So through this, oh, and I, I do have to apologize about the background noise. I live, um, my family, they're essential workers. And also they, just like myself, they bring their, their work home. So their work is also very important. So you might hear um, kind of, uh, I guess, uh, work in the background. So we're all trying to just work and thrive through the pandemic. So let me just continue on here. So the purpose of my study was to develop a model understanding the identity development of the student population. And the guiding research questions for this was, what are the elements of a transporter identity? And then the second question was, what are the intersections and developmental processes? So first through focused, through, I'm sorry, through open coding and analysis, uh, I explored transporter identity and um, some of the themes that emerged were relating to similar to the themes in the literature. So uh, translanguaging, belonging, resistance, adaptability, and sense of belonging on both sides of the border, not just through physical interactions, but also through civic leadership and activism. And then looking at intersectionalities through focused data collection analysis. I, the, what I found was the intersections of a transporter identity for the participants of my, of my study were uh, socioeconomic status, mixed status families, foster care, first generation college students, sexual orientation, race and ethnicity, and gender. Through the following in vivo codes, we can see uh, the, the themes and interactions of uh, these themes um, experienced by the participants. So, so some of the, so I am happy to discuss and explore these themes further um, during, during the Q&A, but what I will illustrate are the themes of mixed status family and sexual orientation. And then the following themes, I'm happy to, to answer any questions about any specific themes during the Q&A. So for sexual orientation, particularly talking about um, how, how do you experience social, um, se uh, sexual orientation, living through a border, living between two, two nations. Here, the participant began with this image. And he illustrated that like borders, borders, borders are man-made, just like racism. And in this image, you can see the border just, you know, bleeding through the, into the ocean. Um, but then, you know, he, re he referenced the sky, he referenced the ocean that is natural, it is there, but yet the border isn't because isms are not, are not natural. But here he explains it much better. Um, and let me read, read this right here. Being transporter does inform my queer identity and my queer identity informs my transporter identity. Being transporter allows me to experience firsthand the differences of being queer in different parts of the world. It allows me to understand that attitudes and beliefs about queer people are socially constructed and vary according to geographical location. Being a transporter queer allows me to be sensitive to the realities that being queer in other places might not look the same and allows me to appreciate the importance of individual experience. It allows me to understand that we all experience the world differently, yet we are connected through these experiences and the flow of ideas. Being transporter has given me a sense of global citizenship, responsibility, and in uplifting not just those in my community, but those around the world. For they are also, they also form, shape, and influence my community, a community without borders. So we can see various themes here relating to the model I presented. Definitely the, the intersections of transporter identity and queer identity and uh, sexual orientation for this participant, but also the, the concepts of building bridges, not walls, the, the concept of solidarity and um, through activism and civic leadership on both sides of the border, which that illustrates the sense of belonging to, to, um, to both San Diego and Tijuana and how they engage in those environments. The next te uh, theme, excuse me, is mixed status families. Through my research, um, there were three main reasons why transporter students lived transporter lives um, initially. 
The first was um, the economic hardship, still the, uh, facing food and housing insecurities. So uh, that was actually my experience as well um, as a child um, and for several participants in this study. The second reason was that they were part of a long lineage of transfronterizos and transfronterizas and um, a long lineage of transporter families that had deep connections and ties on both sides of the border since um, prior generations from their parents to their grandparents. And, you know, it was only natural to engage and live uh, like that. Um, actually, they explained, you know, I began to live a transporter life. Um, I can't really recall they would share. It was since I, since I was born. And then there was mixed status families. Some of the participants in my study lived transborder lives to stay together, to stay together with their families faced by, by deportation um, and um, se family separation. They, they crossed the border every day to stay together. And um, here this participant explained um, how that looked like for him and specifically how that also influenced um, his his role in activism and his role in civic leadership and specifically on activism against, um, against family separation specifically. So he shared, I've overcome family separation and homelessness. These are issues that intersect and sometimes are product of failed policy in Washington, be in Congress or be in the executive level, going back to just 20 years and the operations that federal governments had when it comes to immigration. My father was deported, so that kind of left the door open for my family to end up in the streets. And we saw clearly the lack of resources and policy and systems that can help out the families like ours in this region, San Diego, the US Mexico region. That story is not exclusive to us, but it is really something that is shared. That a lot of people around, you know, from San Diego to Mexicali and further down closer to the Gulf of Mexico, people go through these experiences, especially when the main breadwinner of the family is taken away. So again, we can see various um, intersections of identity. Um, he is specifically talking about his experience as a mixed status, um, being part of a mixed status family, yet how that influenced his um, life, his transborder life, and and even um, you know harsher realities like um, homelessness. And also, he he shared um, in his interview um, having been placed in the foster care system because of this. And. In, in addition to this experience, I mean, uh, there is a concept of resilience, yet, you know, the resiliences are not exclusive to, to the harsh realities and pains that these students live. Um, uh, through one of the factors that influenced his academic success, uh, of course, was resilience, but it wasn't an easy task. And ultimately, at this moment, he's currently um, uh, pursuing doctoral studies. So uh, that's another um, uh, aspect of the findings and the participants that um, they're, you know, significant, they've engaged in significant leadership roles in their academic success. So I want to conclude with um, these organizations. Um, noteworthy are the grassroots student-led organizations that are fostering the success of Transfronterizo students in the San Diego Tijuana border region. And I leave you with their contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions during the Q&A and this is the end of my presentation. Uh, Vanessa, thank you so much for that presentation. I don't think we're gonna have time for questions after um, each one, but we'll pick up questions at the end. I'm dying to talk to you about using photo voice. It's my new favorite methodology. Um, and now, Dr. Martha Gutierrez, uh, it's you're on. <laughs> bueno, me toca hablar en español. Voy a hacer la presentación de este proyecto de investigación realizado en un programa académico denominado Education Unidos por parte de la, de la Universidad de Arizona y el programa FOBESI de la Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores. Este, eh, esta investigación lleva por título Proceso de Aprendizaje de Estudiantes Bilingües en la Frontera y estuvo bajo la dirección de la doctora Era Kralovic. Me gustaría empezar pues con esta frase de Voltaire que nos dice que todos los hombres tienen iguales derechos a la libertad, a la propiedad 
y a la protección de las leyes, incluidas entre ellas la educación. Esta investigación fue realizada en la zona fronteriza ubicada en los estados de Arizona y Sonora, específicamente en la localidad de Douglas, Arizona, se realizó en una escuela preparatoria. Por el contexto geográfico, en esta zona, pues la migración es bastante frecuente. Así también el tránsito de personas que van a trabajar hacia el lado estadounidense por parte de, de, de la localidad de Agua Prieta. Lo mismo sucede con la aquellos estudiantes que cruzan diariamente la frontera para recibir las clases en las, en las escuelas que están ubicadas en esta zona. Debido a esto, pues el fenómeno de la migración es en el cual se basa la principal actividad económica de esta zona. En la escuela eh, preparatoria, la población es aproximada de 1.400 eh, estudiantes, de los cuales, si permítanme presentarles este gráfico, eh, de los cuales pues el 97% son de origen hispano el, el porcentaje eh, el, el resto del porcentaje pues están pertenecientes a otros orígenes esto eh, también pues facilita que haya una dinámica bilingüe al interior de la escuela la planta docente que es de aproximadamente 66 docentes el 50% son bilingües manejando en este caso español e inglés. Sin embargo, toda la instrucción eh, por parte de los docentes es en inglés. Durante algunas observaciones para llegar pues, a, la, a las preguntas de investigación en, esta, en este proyecto, pues nos dimos, eh, nos dimos cuenta que había algunas actitudes como falta de interés, apatía, desmotivación, eh, comportamientos catalogados como malos, eh, un bajo rendimiento académico por parte de los estudiantes en asignaturas como ciencias y matemáticas. Eh, y por lo antes expuesto, pues la dinámica bilingüe al interior de las aulas era bastante, eh, era bastante eh, presente y persistente. Estas observaciones pues, nos llevaron a preguntarnos, bueno, y entonces, ¿cómo es que aprenden los estudiantes bilingües que están asistiendo a escuelas en, en, el, lado, en el lado americano. Eh, ¿Cuál es la dinámica del proceso de aprendizaje? Y también nos interesaba conocer aquellas estrategias utilizadas por esos estudiantes y el impacto del uso del, eh, del primer idioma en este proceso cognitivo. Para poder obtener la información, pues se seleccionaron estudiantes que cursaban eh, las materias de matemáticas y la materia de ciencias eh, y estudiantes que además estaban inscritos en el programa de ELD, que es eh, un programa eh, dirigido a aquellos estudiantes cuya lengua eh, materna no sea el inglés. Para poder comparar el comportamiento de estos estudiantes, pues se seleccionaron también estudiantes que asistían a clases de manera regular y eh, quienes el inglés ya, era, ya estaba perfeccionado para conocer las diferencias. ¿Y qué fue lo que encontramos? Bueno, a través de una, de una entrevista eh, dividida en, en secciones eh, para recuperar el contexto socio, sociocultural, para recuperar las habilidades lingüísticas y las preferencias, así también como las estrategias de estudio y las necesidades como estudiantes bilingües, encontramos lo siguiente. Estos, estas son las categorías que se encontraron eh, o que emergieron a la hora de recuperar la información de las entrevistas. No voy a ahondar en todas, pero lo que quiero es que se de que toda esta información que emerge tiene mucho que ver con la cuestión cultural, la cuestión familiar y eh, sobre todo cuestiones emocionales por parte de los estudiantes también eh, que estaban inscritos en el programa de ILD. Toda esta información se fue organizando para poder eh, pues contestar la pregunta que nos, que nos traía a cuenta. Aquí les presento la descripción sociocultural de estos estudiantes. Los nombres fueron cambiados, sin embargo, conservan esta raíz por parte de, de los estudiantes. 
si ustedes observan, la mayoría de los estudiantes, la mayoría de los estudiantes nacieron en Estados Unidos. Y, eh, pero el origen de sus familias es mexicana. Esto que, que, que ocasiona que pues, el primer lenguaje que ellos utilicen sea el español aún en aquellos casos donde los estudiantes ya dominan el inglés. ¿Esto qué ocasiona? Bueno, ¿o qué nos permitió, a, qué, ¿a qué nos permitió llegar? Que las estrategias que los estudiantes bilingües y no bilingües eh, estudian, eh, este, utilizan para poder adquirir el conocimiento, es, son estrategias tradicionales, como leer notas, la traducción de palabras o prestar atención lo que ocasiona que sean solamente receptores de información y los aleja de aquellas estrategias que pudieran estar enfocadas hacia el constructivismo, que, son, que es parte de los nuevos modelos educativos. Otra estrategia que ellos utilizan es memorizar la información y lo hacen precisamente para no cometer errores, lo que pudiera garantizar que ellos tengan un, tra, un, tra, un trayecto exitoso a lo largo de la preparatoria. Las asignaturas con mayor, pues, mayor índice de reprobación son ciencias y matemáticas y cuando ellos no entienden un contenido o un concepto, lo que hacen es clarificarlos primeramente con los estudiantes y la razón es porque lo pueden hacer en español. La última instancia a la cual recurren es al docente. El, el lenguaje que ellos prefieren para poder aclarar dudas en algunos, eh, en, sobre algunos contenidos es el español. Eh, algunas sugerencias que se recuperaron por parte de los estudiantes era precisamente eh, que los maestros deberían dar algunas explicaciones en español y mejorar también estas ex explicaciones para que ellos pudieran eh, tener acceso a la información y, e ir construyendo su conocimiento. El impacto, el impacto que tiene el lenguaje en, en el proceso de, de aprendizaje de los estudiantes, lo pudimos, de acuerdo a esta información, se pudo dividir en tres áreas. El área social, el área emocional y el área de desempeño académico. En el área social, pues el lenguaje, el primer lenguaje es la forma en cómo ellos transmiten cultura y reciben cultura desde la familia y también ¿Por qué no? Desde la escuela debería de ser. Así también el lenguaje les permite a ellos tener una mejor interacción con sus pares, con los docentes y con la familia. En el aspecto emocional, y aquí me enfoco solamente en los estudiantes de ELD, que son los que están aprendiendo el inglés porque fueron recién matriculados en la escuela preparatoria, el, cuando se les pregunta, ¿tú qué sientes cuando tu maestro te habla en español? pues simplemente empiezan a generar confianza, generan lazos de confianza y cuando se les es prohibido utilizar su idioma, ellos eh, presentan actitudes como frustración, enojo, aburrimiento e incluso gran parte de estos alumnos eh, piensa en abandonar la escuela porque consideran que nunca van a poder superar la barrera del idioma. Ahora, en lo que refiere al, al desarrollo académico, pues el lenguaje les permite acces, acceder al, al conocimiento y acceder al, a, a otros procesos cognitivos que les van a permitir desarrollarse no solamente en la escuela, sino también en la vida. Una conclusión de las varias a las cuales se llegaron con esta investigación es que en particular a los estudiantes que están inscritos en el programa de ELD, eh, pues están inmersos en un nuevo lenguaje y, su primer, y si su primer lenguaje es prohibido, ellos pudieran no estar desarrollando habilidades que son eh, propias para su edad y propias también para que se puedan desenvolver en la vida. Y esto está ya ampliamente también discutido y soportado por varios autores como Vygotsky, Brunner, Ausbel, y don, quienes eh, han manifestado que el desarrollo y el aprendizaje de los niños está determinado por los agentes culturales. ¿Y quiénes son esos agentes culturales? La familia, el docente y los compañeros. Pero si dentro de la escuela, que es la proveedora en este caso, la que facilita la construcción del aprendizaje, no se da esta interacción en el idioma que ellos necesitan, pues difícilmente se va a poder generar esta construcción de 
conocimiento. Y no sé cómo, cómo vamos de tiempo, pero bueno, eh, quisiera, quisiera decir que parte de la restricción de los maestros de no utilizar el idioma español proviene de esta, de esta ley, la proposición 203 Arizona, la cual pues eh, en ningún momento prohíbe el uso eh, o las explicaciones en español utilizando el idioma materno de los estudiantes, pero como que existe una, un mal entendimiento de esta ley. Eh, lo que sí refuerza esta, esta, esta ley es que se debe de fortalecer la escritura y la lectura del lenguaje inglés. Sin embargo, pues dentro de, las, dentro de la escuela los maestros no lo utilizan y mucho menos en aquellos estudiantes que están ah, iniciando su proceso. Marta. Sí. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to have to cut you off. We're running no we're running long. But I just I did want to say that I thought the work that you did at Douglas High School and I thought the courage that you had to raise some of these issues, especially the issues of the guest teachers on in the schools was really powerful. And I really want to thank you for being here. And I know there's going to be a million questions for you, but we're going to move on now to Dr. Ileana Reyes, who uh, will introduce her research team and talk about the work that they've been doing. So Ileana, to you. Muy buenas tardes. Thank you, Dr. Aera, uh, for your um, invitation to join you here today, and also to Dr. Stephanie Etie and Dr. Nadia Álvarez. Eh, daré la breve introducción en español y después de ahí eh, cambio al inglés para compartir la presentación que tenemos junto con Teresa Acevedo y con, este, con Selena Martínez, mis dos colegas de este proyecto. Voy a compartir mi pantalla. Perfect. Um, eh, soy la decana asociada en el área académica y de relaciones de, en la comunidad aquí en la Facultad y Colegio de Educación en la Universidad de Arizona. Bienvenidos. Y con esto cambio al inglés para facilitar el trabajo de los intérpretes. I am sharing today a study together with my colleagues Teresa Acevedo and Selena Martinez. Teresa Acevedo is the co-founder for Tucson Children's Project. Who, the, the works in advancing the rights and potential of all children and families here in Tucson in Southern Arizona. And Selena Martinez, also a colleague who's a specialist in child in, in for Child Parent Center. And she provides Head Start teachers uh, support for curriculum throughout five counties here in Southern Arizona. So we're happy here to share with you on documenting the multiple languages and theories of children in the borderlands. And theories, I should say. And I wanted to thank also Consul Barcelo because in a way he uh, uh, helped us bridge uh, the work that we're doing here because he talked his, himself about his theories, you know, when he was a child. And I love, you know, when he shared about how he thought the world might end just five kilometers, you know, south of his own uh, hometown. But in reality, as he continued growing, you know, he realized how these um, different borders, you know, expanded. So this is exactly the kind of work that um, we uh, with Teresa and Selena have been documented with many, many teachers and they will be able to share with you more details on that. I'm gonna continue here just to share additional, you know, um, details about our partnership. And I wanted to say again, that this, this is a partnership between Tucson Children's Project, Head Start, which is um, named Child Parent Centers here in Tucson, and then ourselves at the University of Arizona. And as Dr. Era actually mentioned earlier today too, I think for me and for my colleagues, it's so important to really situate our context, the study, you know, where this happened, also the, the people and the participants in our communities. How do they situate here in the Sonoran Desert and in the borderlands? And I want to, I want to share that it, when we have um, the borderlands geographically, that is one reference point, but we continue to learn in um, accumulated experiences that go beyond what we call the borderlands uh, experience. And as you will see, children, four and five-year-olds in this study are actually co-constructing that sense of place in their own construction of what the borderlands mean for them and adding you know, to their geographical 
situated, you know, uh, location where they are. We actually share also, as Dr. Marta and Eda, our passion of the borderlands. And one particular point is in Douglas and Agua Prieta, where this study took place. It took place on the US side, but with children who cross the border, um, not only often, but some of them daily to come to their preschool classroom. Uh, as you know, you can see here, the population is uh, small. It's about 17,000 um, 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 community members, uh, probably a little bit more. And we're gonna be sharing with you about also about their bilingual theories, how they use English and Spanish. Uh, and it's a population that is mainly Latino, uh, Mexican uh, background. And just a couple of pictures, just to give you una probadita en español, as you will hear from both Teresa and Selena on what the children's actually participated in a border, border wall exploration study in their classroom and how they constructed beyond again, the fence as we will hear soon, but also riven messages for their family members and also for their teachers and their parents uh, using different ribbons in the right side of this uh, of the picture and also in the left, you know, writing and painting. You will see multiple literacies. So beyond writing and reading, what they're learning in the classroom, they're also learning about these other languages from a Reggio Emilia perspective. And from a theoretical framework that comes from a socio-constructivist perspective, just like um, Dr. Gutierrez was also mentioning, for us, bilingualism and biliteracy development in these children go beyond the oral and written language. Um, they, they do this through direct interactions with people and the different artifacts they uh, encounter both in the classroom, but also at home, particularly right now, um, as we have, you know, go beyond the digital era, you know, in terms of borderlands. Uh, this study was situated before the pandemic, so you will see some clear examples, you know, how this happened in the classroom. So we understand literacy development really to examine the multiple um, uses of languages, but also the transformation that happens with these cultural artifacts in their day-to-day -day interactions. And with this, I wanted to pass on the microphone and camera to Teresa Acevedo, who's going to lead us into the study. Thank you. Teresa. Okay. Okay, buenas tardes. Uh, it's a wonderful and it's a great pleasure to hear everybody today. And this is a very exciting event, um, I think, for our nation, really, in many ways. So um, I'm going to give you uh, just a short highlight and introduction into what Selena will uh, move through, which is children as researchers in action. And so you will see hopefully some of the theories and the philosophies of this particular curriculum framework um, in action in several ways, both for the children and families. So um, the team that's represented has two schools in uh, Douglas, Arizona. And again, as uh, Ileana mentioned, they're both, uh, it's, it's really a neighborhood with uh, a border there. So there's four preschool classrooms, two preschool three-year-old classrooms, and there's home visitors that go into the homes as uh, part of the uh, infant toddler birth to three. So let's see. Okay, so um, in the 1990s, when um, all the No Child Left Behind and the publishers sort of started taking over a lot of uh, curriculum and data became the big, um, the big quantitative measure for everything, um, we as a group of educators went through many, many of the publishers' curriculum. And we were a little bit disappointed in terms of how didactic it seemed, and also that the regions were not particularly uh, represented well. So we decided that um, in this, uh, in, in Head Start Child Parent Centers, which covered about 2,000, 2,500 children in five counties, some along Nogales, the border, uh, New Mexico, and other places, we decided that we would do a locally constructed curriculum. And um, some of the guiding principles that you're gonna see in terms of the action that Selena is gonna go through with children and families is that the image of the rights of children and families, that is 
how people think teachers, anybody in your community, thinks about the child is really the way that you interact and have a relationship with the children and family. So the image of the child and the rights of the children and families is really one of the foundational tenets that happens. So um, the second kind of principle and, and, and these principles direct strategies as well. Listening, observing and documenting is the system that is three pronged that captures all the cultural, linguistic, the multiple intelligence of children and families, and they bring, they bring those topics as co-constructors and respect for one another so that um, there is competence. It's rather than a deficit look at what a child is not doing, it's really what is their competence and what is the competence and experience, values and beliefs that the family and community bring. And those are some of the interests that happen in the classrooms that you're gonna see and how children per pursue their own intelligence. Um, the also the framework because it's it's not really it's a curriculum framework. The creativity, imagination are equated with critical thinking, and in the '90s, not so much, and even now, uh, was really imagination, creativity, really a way of looking at cognition. So this framework was bringing in the notion that all disciplines are occurring all the time in children's mind because they're born natural researchers. And that natural researcher concept comes from uh, Loris Malaguzzi, who was one of the founders of the Reggio Emilia approach um, after World War II. And also the framework is looks at quantitative and qualitative metrics and that they are equal, they are of equal importance. And that equal importance is always a struggle because the data assessment is attached to the power of money and of course, publishers. So that kind of gives you a little uh, taste of what's coming. Um, so this uh, locally designed curriculum framework, uh, its intent was to open up as a framework to be possible to use in any region. So it was to advance the cultural and linguistic responses of the larger geographic area served. So if you were in Nogales or if you in, uh, in Duncan, Arizona, where there's agriculture or where there, you were in a, a, a urban setting, uh, the cultural values and linguistic uh, diversity was honored and it was relevant in the classrooms. And that was one of the uh, reasons we went to this framework. So rather than using a prescribed uh, curriculum, we went to, um, to this uh, larger context where domains of learning are integrated. And this comment means that in the Reggio Emilia philosophy and the constructivist philosophy is that if from music to language to uh, dance, every discipline is integrated. And I, I wanted to share a quote from um, a poet that uh, uh, Alberto Rios, who is a poet from Nogales, Arizona. I think he was the Arizona Poet Laureate for some time. This is a poem. Um, two sentences out of his poem that I thought were really relevant and connected to many of the things that people have said previously uh, in their presentations about experiences and culture and languages. Um, I grew up on the border and when I left, I brought it with me wherever I've gone. And um, I think that this really speaks to the broadness of uh, citizens of the world. And so I wanted to share that with you. And I think that um, the beginning of the study is going to go into action here, which is uh, with Selena is our next presenter. So Selena. 
Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Ileana. And thank you for this invitation and giving us an opportunity to share the Bridging Borders study with you all. Um, this um, study began during a professional development where teachers were um, asked to discuss our community and our immediate context. And during this discussion, um, it was decided that um, since we live close to the border, let's talk about and explore with children fences, walls, and enclosures. So as a team, we created um, and came up with questions that we can post children to help them share their theories and ideas and thoughts around um, their own identity as far as where what the community offers or they can explore with fences, walls, and enclosures. And here are some questions that we um, ask the children to think about. Like, why do you think fences are? What are fences for? Um, where do you see a fence? So as the study continued and these questions kept um, coming up, children began to look at what was around them, what was around their homes, um, what they saw when they traveled to school, what they saw when they traveled to Agua Preta Sonora to visit families or to visit their homes. And they began using a variety of materials to create um, their thoughts and ideas of what fences look like. Mm -hmm. Children's imagination and experiences um, were brought out and the children shared verbally what they thought about what fences and enclosures were for. You know, and here are some quotes from some children. Es, es para que el perro no se salga y no se vaya. Children's thoughts and thinking were about that. Fences, walls, and enclosures are to keep things safe or to keep things out, to keep them safe or to or keep people inside things. It would so happen that during this study that was happening in the classroom, um, President Trump was talking about building a wall along the, the border. And throughout the classrooms, we read the Daily Cassette. And once a week in Douglas, Arizona, the Daily Cassette offers the community a question. And the question came up to the community and children were able to share their thoughts about it. And the question was, do you support President Donald Trump's border wall um, order? So as we continued to discuss this with children and children began to see things from their and share from their perspective of what a wall is. Because in the beginning, all they talked about and shared about was about fences. Fence has an opening, a fence you can see through. And when this, when during the reading of the Daily Cassette and they talked about a wall, children began to share their ideas and thoughts about, I think there's a difference between a fence and a wall. So we decided to take the children on a field trip because one of the centers lives five blocks away from the Douglas Agua Preta border. During this field trip, children began to notice that the fence on the Douglas side was completely different from the fence from Agua Preta Sonora side. And one of the main differences that Agua Preta Sonora has a variety of murals along the border fence and Douglas side has none. The, the border fence is something that is part of the daily life of the children. Many of us cross on a daily basis. We see it on a daily basis. And children began to express their own points of view about the President Trump's order 
for building of the wall. It's gonna to cost too much money. You know, my families live over there. You know, is there gonna be a door? Are we gonna be able to see our family and cross over if he builds a wall? During one of the conversations that I had with two children in the classroom, Luis and Emilia's, they were telling me what they were studying about. And they were sharing that their theories and ideas about the border fence and connecting it to their home, that their homes don't have fences, don't have walls, excuse me, they have a fence. It might look like a wall, but it's not because the fence, it is for my house and not the United States. And Luis, one of the children in the classroom began to tell me the story of Jesus Garcia, who was a hero of Nakosari. So children were very aware of what their life was about, where they lived, where they came from, and how this order from the President Trump was going to affect them. So as the study continued, parents began to become curious of what was happening in the classroom. And they wanted to become involved and take part of this. So parents began to share their voices of what they were hearing their children talking about at home and what they were hearing children saying when they were crossing the border to come to school or crossing the border to visit their families. They were also part of extending and deepening the study by bringing us pictures of the mural that of, of many murals along the Agua Preta Sonora border fence and participating in the classroom of sharing of their own stories. As the study continued, the fence building of the of the wall, children began to think about well, it's not just going to affect me and my family but it's also gonna affect animals and plants that cross the border if a wall is built. Throughout this study, many um, committees in the classrooms were created. There was committees of children who would research and look for many other pictures to study. There was committees in the classroom that um, children were the leaders of, okay, if we're gonna create something, what could it be, what could we create? And so when teaching staff posed the children a question, if you could create or change the Douglas fence, what would you do or what would it be? And as many committees of children came together, they decided to create a butterfly mural. So they use a variety of materials to create their butterfly mural and they chose the butterfly because in their eyes, the butterfly can fly everywhere. The butterfly can fly around the world and you can't catch a butterfly. And this is one of the representations that the children created throughout this study. Thank you, Ileana. Thank you, uh, Ilya. Yeah, I just wanted to thank both Teresa and Selena for sharing about the documentation. You have our information here, and we hope to see you all in Tucson in October. And as Selena has called it, this is this was just a teaser. So we hope you know you can join us so we can tell you more about the professional development that happened throughout the study of the um, borderlands and the border study here. And so you can also see many of the images that the parents themselves took via their iPhones or phones, I'm sorry, just their phones and they brought that into the classroom. So that collaboration, we hope to be able to, to share with you in the future. Thank you again, Dr. Eda. Thank you so much for sharing this work. Uh, I do have to say Reggio Emilio educational philosophy is something that is very, very important to me. So I would love to come visit your schools if we could ever travel again. 
<laughs> but um, our, our last presenter is Dr. Gloria Valdez. She is a professor and researcher at the College of Sonora, and she's going to bring this uh, panel home. Bueno, sí, buenas tardes. ¿Me escuchan? Yes. Sí. Bueno, eh, me da mucho gusto estar aquí. Eh, yo les voy a presentar eh, un programa que tenemos desde el lado este, mexicano, aquí en el Colegio de Sonora en Hermosillo, Sonora. Y como eh, el Seminario Niñez Migrante del de Colegio de Sonora está trabajando eh, para este, eh, ofrecer apoyo a niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes que han retornado desde Estados Unidos en los últimos años. No veo mi cara, ¿verdad? Este, ya, no sé si la están viendo ustedes. Este... Pero bueno, voy a continuar. Este, eh, la siguiente, por favor. Creo que Mike nos va a estar ayudando. Sí, ¿qué es el Seminario Niñez Migrante? Aquí estoy. Saludos a todos desde Hermosillo, Sonora. ¿Qué es el Seminario Niñez Migrante? A mí me gustaría decirles que el Seminario Niñez Migrante es un espacio que nació hace... 14 años aproximadamente en este centro de investigación que se llama el Colegio de Sonora en Hermosillo, Sonora. Teníamos muy poca información acerca de la participación de niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes en, en, en el estado de Sonora. Tanto niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes de tránsito, de retorno, en calidad de refugio, etc. Los estudios sobre la migración internacional en México se habían enfocado a la participación de, del varón como, pro, como el proveedor de la familia, ¿verdad? Que migraba hacia eh, Estados Unidos cruzando el río Bravo, etc. Posteriormente, en los 80 se incorporaron, este, dado la presión de los estudios feministas, la visibilización de las mujeres en la migración internacional. Sin embargo, eh, aunque los niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes han participado desde hace mucho en la migración internacional, eh, tiene reciente... Son aproximadamente unos 15 años que se le ha visibilizado en los estudios de la migración internacional que habían visibilizado la presencia del adulto. Sin embargo, eh, los niños, niñas y adolescentes eran representados como acompañantes pasivos, como hermanos, etcétera, no como actores migrantes con agencia propia. De ahí surge el seminario Niñez Migrante. La que sigue, por favor. Sí, tenemos varias actividades aquí en el Seminario Niñez Migrante. Tenemos actividades de capacitación. Esta capacitación va dirigida a maestros, directores de escuela y personal administrativo de educación básica. Va dirigido a ellos para que ellos sepan cuáles son las necesidades que traen en especial los niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes que están retornando a Sonora. Aproximadamente en los últimos 10 años han retornado a Sonora, eh, los últimos 7 eh, o 10 años han, han retornado 35 a 40 mil niños, niñas y adolescentes a nuestro estado procedentes de Estados Unidos, especialmente de Arizona y California. Este, también tenemos, este, cap, eh, aparte de la capacitación, a estos, a estos maestros para que estos niños sean visibilizados en el aula, para que lo, los maestros en el aula sepan que los niños, niñas y adolescentes, basadas en la investigación que nosotros tenemos haciendo desde hace ocho años sobre los niños que retornan, debido a la política antimigrante o a la deportación de la familia o de algún miembro de la familia o porque eh, la familia decide regresarse bajo la presión que está teniendo en Estados Unidos este, para que los maestros entiendan, comprendan y empaticen con la situación del niño o niña recién llegado. ¿sí? También tenemos eh, la celebración del Día de Acción de Gracias. Este es un evento que celebramos en el Colegio de Sonora 
tenemos ocho años celebrándolo, el año de pasado, el 2020, no se celebró por la pandemia, así es que es un evento eh, abierto, es cuando el Colegio de Sonora abre las puertas a toda la comunidad, tenemos aproximadamente de 100 a 150 niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes, mamá, papá, abuelos, hermanos, que este, cenan eh, gratuitamente la típica cena de acción de gracias. Y eso es muy importante. ¿Por qué? Porque ahora estamos trasladando colores, sabores, olores de norte a sur. No nos esperábamos eso, ¿verdad? Pues ahora es al revés. Ahora estamos trasladando toda esa tradición, pero de norte a sur. Entonces, para nosotros es muy importante que estos niños, niñas y adolescentes que están regresando a Sonora, muchos de ellos nacieron en Estados Unidos, muchos de ellos fueron llevados desde muy chiquitos, eh, sigan perpetuando sus tradiciones, ahora de norte a sur, y parte de su tradición es el Día de Acción de Gracias. Y por último, quiero decirles que el programa que tenemos es un programa de asesorías escolares. Acabo de leer en el chat alguien, alguien que preguntó si había mmm, clases este, eh, en inglés o clases para niños migrantes. Aquí nosotros en Hermosillo tenemos esta, este programa de asesorías gratuitas para niños, niñas y adolescentes migrantes. Se hace una vez a la semana, los miércoles de 5 a 6 y media, donde los niños son asesorados en sus tareas y donde nosotros mantenemos el vínculo y el puente con los maestros en sus escuelas. Para ello tenemos maestro de español y maestro de matemáticas, que son ellos maestros preparados, normalistas, ¿verdad? Que tienen mucha experiencia. Lo que pretendemos es es que este programa de asesorías escolares transite al niño y al, y al adolescente de la escuela donde venía en Estados Unidos a la escuela donde llega. En México no tenemos un programa que los transite. Entonces, nosotros aquí en Hermosillo es lo que estamos haciendo. La que sigue, por favor. Entonces, sin embargo, ¿qué es lo que está pasando con el covid este 19 que desde marzo 17 del 2020 eh, tuvimos que cancelar la, el programa de asesorías presenciales, tuvimos que cancelar el día de acción de gracias y tuvimos que cancelar la capacitación a maestros y maestras de educación básica. Bueno, pues tenemos que innovar. La contingencia, compañeros maestros y colegas, hace que nosotros implementemos estrategias creativas para seguir incorporando otras formas de representación eh, con los actores. Es decir, qué estrategias metodológicas ¿verdad? pueden apoyarnos eh, en vez del trabajo de campo tradicional que no podíamos hacer. Es decir, cómo estar sin estar. La que sigue, por favor. Entonces, nosotros lo que hemos estado haciendo es una etnografía en tiempos de confinamiento. La que sigue, por favor. Sí, entonces, a, a mí me gustaría presentar este modelo eh, como una manera de provocar, ¿verdad?, reacciones y con mucho gusto yo puedo contestar preguntas después o durante la semana. Para nosotros es muy importante decirles que en el 2020 fue un año de desafíos. Entonces, nosotros creamos una metodología etnográfica apoyada de varias situaciones, ¿verdad? Una metodología de retazos, ¿sí? Este, eh, si este fuese un triángulo equilátero, ¿verdad? Más o menos traté de que fuera un triángulo equilátero. La base, este, colegas y maestros y alumnos que nos ven, la base sin duda alguna son eh, los lazos de confianza que nosotros hemos establecido desde hace dos años con los actores. Es decir, no podríamos haber creado esta metodología para implementarla en tiempo de contingencia si no hubiésemos tenido esos lazos previos con los actores, ¿verdad? Este, donde hemos convivido por dos años en este programa de asesoría, hemos eh, este, eh, con, compartido fiestas, reuniones, festejos. Su servidora 
entra como oyente al programa de asesorías con mi diario de campo. Yo solamente apunto las interacciones que hay entre los niños y adolescentes y los maestros. Las preguntas, las inquietudes, las omisiones, etc. Eh, eh, apunto metodológicamente hablando este, lo que observo y de vez en cuando participo, ¿verdad? Entonces, todo esto... Eh, fue la base para nosotros poder seguir construyendo este modelo. La, el otra área, la otra área del triángulo, sin duda alguna, fue las estrategias virtuales que implementamos. Es decir, este, grabamos mensajes de voz, llamadas por teléfono por teléfono hicimos, su servidora hizo grabaciones de algunos videos, implementamos un eh, programa de, de, de lectura de cuentos que los transmitimos por el chat del de programa de asesorías, también un concurso de dibujo relativo al COVID, etcétera, etcétera. Entrevistamos a los padres de familia y a los niños a través de teléfono y a través de este, mensajes de WhatsApp. Esa es la otra parte. Y la otra parte del triángulo, pues es eh, revisión documental, que se estaba escribiendo en torno a las estrategias metodológicas para seguir trabajando, este, bibliografía eh, eh, y seguimiento de los periódicos. La que sigue, por favor. Entonces, eh, lo que yo les quiero presentar eh, es que el trabajo de campo no terminó y no ha terminado, ¿verdad? Estas son las estrategias virtuales, ¿verdad? Aquí está su servidora con un, con un pequeñito video diciendo que se suspenden las, las asesorías, que vamos a estar en comunicación, eh, dando información, etcétera, etcétera. Aquí en México se implementó el programa Aprende en Casa 1, Aprende en Casa 2 y Aprende en Casa 3. Pero imagínense, si en el aula cara a cara, los niños, niñas y adolescentes que retornan tienen dificultades para entender el español de la maestra que está hablando, ahora imagínense virtualmente. De esta manera, a través del teléfono, a través de eh, mensajes de voz, a través de eh, este, mm, mensajes de texto, pudimos orientar a estos niños y padres de familia sobre cómo conectarse al programa, sobre cómo eh, seguir a, 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 haciendo los papeles para regularizar al hijo o a la hija, etcétera, etcétera. La que sigue, por favor. Gloria, sí. Thank you so much for Gracias. sharing the, the amazing work that um, you're doing and the importance of building relationships in order to have collaborations is a message Thank that you. hits hard with me. But um, now I think, is it Nadia who's been gathering the questions and has maybe just one or two questions for the panel before we go into breakout rooms? Yes, Era, we have two questions. Uh, uh, is, is Steph has one question and I have another one. So I don't know, is Steph, if you would like to go first, please. Sure. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank you all for the interesting work that you've discussed with us. I know there will be many, many questions for you and we will have a breakout room that will, will enable people to have questions for the panel. Uh, um, questions here is um, from Christina Tomasic. She says she's curious about how you address the topic and make meaning of the student's reality um, in this divided situation. And have you encountered families or students who object to the study of the wall itself and its implications? If you haven't yet, how would you deal with these situations? Selena. Quisiera responder. Would you like to answer the part in terms of the families? And of course, any other colleague, you know, that also the question applies to. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question, Stephanie? I apologize. Surely. Um, the question is, um, have you encountered families or students who object to the study of the wall itself? and its implications. If you haven't, how would you deal with these situations when they arise? 
during the course of the study, um, we were very um, appreciative and grateful that the parents from the beginning have, were always involved with their child's learning. When we began the study, we talked to the parents during parent meetings, we presented what the children would be talking about, what we'd be exploring, and we invited parents to take part of this study. And like I said, we are very grateful that they were very involved and, and had a major piece in, in, in the Bridging Borders study. They were Thank excited. Uh, they, I'm sorry, they were excited and willing to share their history and their own thoughts about how the, the fence, the wall had affected them. Thank you. Nadia, you're up next. Y voy a hacer una pregunta, voy a cambiar para hacer la pregunta en español que, que tenemos aquí. Y la pregunta en español es, ¿cómo se pueden informar del programa que ofrece el Colegio de Sonora para participar en él como educador? Muchas gracias. Eh, es muy buena pregunta. En, la, en el último slide, creo que ya iba a terminar, ahí están las redes del Colegio de Sonora y del Seminario Niñez Migrante, pero ustedes pueden buscar en cualquier eh, buscador este el Seminario Niñez Migrante en Facebook, en Instagram y en la misma página del Colegio de Sonora, www.colson.edu. Y ahí, ahí pueden encontrar todos los programas y, y están completamente eh, invitados a participar, este, son, son capacitaciones eh, gratuitas, libres, y también este, eh, en los programas que tenemos en el, en el colegio. Muchas gracias, doctora, gracias. por su respuesta. Esther. Would somebody else care to answer? If not, what I will be happy to do now is to organize us into some breakout rooms for further discussion. We want to thank the panel and the consul and Dr. Daryl Joseph um, for all the all that they've brought us today. And we believe at APLAC that the heart of our association is making spontaneous connections across borders and building collaborations.